I would like to welcome everyone here today, especially our guests. We are really honored to have you. In the name of God, the graceful, the, the gracious, the merciful, ta sin mim. These are the verses of the clear book. We narrate to you from the history of Moses and Pharaoh, in truth, for people who believe. Pharaoh exalted himself in the land and divided its people into factions. He persecuted a group of them, slaughtering their sons while sparing their daughters. He was truly a corrupter. But we desired to favor those who were oppressed in the land, and to make them leaders, and to make them the inheritors. 
and to establish them in the land, and to show Pharaoh, Haman, and their troops the very thing they feared. We inspired the mother of Moses. Nurse him. Then, when you fear for him, cast him into the river, and do not fear nor grieve. We will return him to you and make him one of the messengers. Pharaoh's household picked him up to be an opponent and a sorrow for them. Pharaoh, Haman, and their troops were sinners. Fasting is not much to say, it's you know, 
I'm hungry. <laughs> but to us, it's one of our pillars of our faith. We have five pillars prayer, fasting, charity, pilgrimage, and very good to the, to the oneness of God. And uh, uh, fasting takes place in the month of Ramadan. So every day from, sun, from dawn until sunset, we uh, um, hold back food and water. And the idea is that when we uh, kind of uh, suppress somewhat our physical needs and desires, our spirituality is enhanced, uh, our awareness of our Creator is enhanced, and we are sustained by that, by that awareness throughout the day. Also, Ramadan is a time of, of giving, a time of community, a time of reflection. Many Muslims in the last 10 nights of Ramadan will actually go into spiritual seclusion to try to reflect upon the year past, prepare for the year forward, and to commit and to recommit to living a life with purpose and dedication. So that's all I'll say about Ramadan and fasting. Um, but I want to just touch a little bit about why we as Muslims are doing this uh, tonight and why we're reaching out to our indigenous brothers and sisters and having this breaking of bread and breaking of the fast uh, together. The Muslim community is primarily, not completely, but primarily an immigrant community. And this is just a fact of, of, of immigration and, and geography and politics. And immigrants, such as myself, oftentimes aspire to be admitted into the club of the mainstream, to aspire to become part of the mainstream culture. And we are drawn to uh, centers of political and economic power because we want to be, you know, we want to get there like everybody else. And what this really means is that we want to uh, have all the benefits of what we call today white privilege. We want to have all the benefits of white privilege and it's a to that to adopt the narrative of history of Canada that is that is exposed by white privilege and by the mainstream culture. So we are effectively settlers. And this may be okay, but if we want to enjoy the benefits of settlement, then we have to accept the responsibility and the burden that that comes with in that we understand the history of Canada was not simple, that the, what we enjoy today came at an expense of many people. We must accept responsibility for it. We must do something to make amends along with other Canadians. Effectively, we as immigrants, this is interesting because I and many others, we come from countries that have suffered from colonialism, but we have to decolonize our minds when it comes to the history of Canada. And I want to say that we should have a zero tolerance to any racism in our community, but more importantly, the stereotypes that many immigrants will readily adopt about the indigenous community and the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. So <clears throat> we have to play also a role in pushing for action on important issues like missing and burdened indigenous women or, for example, Freedom Road for Shoal Lake. On the issue of, of missing and burdened indigenous women, I will say something very quickly. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad, who was the Prophet of Islam, was once someone came to him and complained of banditry. There are bandits around, they, they were not safe. He said that there will be a time when a, a woman will travel from Hira, which is in Iraq, all the way to Mecca. So this is a journey of thousands of miles, and his time would have taken months to conclude. And he would say that she will travel and she will fear no one. She will have no fear except the fear of God in her heart. So the Prophet chose to give an example of community security uh, through the security of women. Because I think when women are safe, everybody else is safe. When women are free, everyone else is free. When women, when women are empowered, everyone's, everyone else is also empowered. Finally, I just want to say that we are not giving a gift to the coalition. We're not giving a donation. We're not giving a charity. We're just making a small payment on the debt of this long overdue. Thank you.
just so beautiful and so diverse and so uh, beautiful. I mean, what more can I say? I just want to say uh, we wish to the Manitoba Islamic Association for inviting uh, myself and Bernadette uh, to come to speak very briefly. I know people are a tad hungry here. So um, I will keep my comments very brief. Um, I want to first start by saying that um, I did some media interviews and they asked me the importance of tonight. And the importance of tonight is that when we take time to sit together and we take time to understand each other and to hear each other's narratives and to hear our journeys and our experiences, what we actually do is we create family. It's in those moments when we understand each other or we attempt to understand each other and we attempt to understand each other's spirits and our pain and our hurts and our joys and our struggles and our resiliency that we become family. And so tonight, I share with you that we become family tonight. And I think that on that journey of becoming family, um, you know, what I share with you in respect of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada, typically it's a three-month course, but I'm not gonna do that right now. You know, I will keep it very, very brief. What I want people to understand about the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is that it took generations upon generations upon generations to get to where we are in this present moment. As most parts of the world, Canada was colonized. And in that colonial exercise, one of the first things that occurred was a very strategic and methodical attack on indigenous women's identity, our place, our space, when we look at um, our culture, our, 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 our tribes, our nations, our communities, our families, it was understood that indigenous men and indigenous women were equal. Indigenous men and women were so equal that in fact, in most indigenous languages, there wasn't words for he or she or him or her so imagine, everybody in this room knows how our language constructs what we see and what we know to be true. Bad language creates negativity. Positive language creates connection and community. And so, you, can you imagine an indigenous language that didn't even have words for him and her and she and he? What that did was that at that very intrinsic level, Men and women were equal. We understood that. We breathed that day in and day out. And that was manifested in our relationships with one another. Um, in fact, in, in indigenous languages, there's not words for superior or inferior. So another manifestation of the way we understood each other. Uh, women were a part of every single decision-making process that occurred. Uh, women had control over their sexuality, over their reproductive health. Uh, women had um, a very vital role in the, the economy of the community. Um, women raised their children together. Uh, but more importantly, uh, in this very short time period, what I want people to understand is that uh, women were fundamentally understood as sacred and as life givers and were treated as sacred and as life givers. And what happened in the moments, those first moments of contact with newcomers, with explorers, with missionaries, they did not understand what they were seeing because they came from a culture where women were the property of their fathers. And then that, that, that daughter became the property of her husband. That is why women take their husband's last name. It is remnants of when women were literally the property of your father and then to your husband. They couldn't understand why women sat in council. They couldn't understand why women had control over their sexuality and their reproductive health. They couldn't understand why women had such autonomy and independence. And they quickly learned that in order for these 
these lands to be colonized, they had to attack strategically and methodically the identities of indigenous women. And they had to subjugate and oppress indigenous women. And how do you subjugate and oppress women? You shift the language that you use. And so where our people understood women as sacred, as life givers, as equitable, as equal, we start to see the language shift of indigenous women, one to uh, women, indigenous women as promiscuous, indigenous women as whores, as indigenous women as, um, I'm, I'm cognizant that we're in a religious space, so I will, uh, anyways, not very good words. So leave it at that. Um, and so that starts to shift indigenous women's identities and the way that the colonizers see indigenous women. And it's in those moments that you get the, uh, the oppression uh, of indigenous women's bodies and spaces. And so, uh, again, in this very, very short period, it is that language, that, that colonial structure of indigenous women that then gave rise to the violence against indigenous women and girls. Because if you have women and girls that are constructed as less than, that violence is going to be perpetrated against their bodies. And everywhere across the world, in the pursuit of colonialism and imperialism, the brunt of the collateral damage is always on women's bodies. It is always on little girls' bodies and spaces. And in Canada, that's no different. So what I leave you with, because I, I want my sister Bernadette to come up here, is, is to fundamentally understand that uh, Indigenous women uh, were not always oppressed, and were not always uh, preyed upon, and were not always slaughtered. We live in a country in which I, I would suspect that most people would, would know the number of 1,200 missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. That's not accurate. And those of us that do that work know that that number is actually much higher. Um, and women, Indigenous women and girls, are, are being targeted and slaughtered here because of the colonial remnants. But it is literally moments like this that shift that so that our issues um, and our struggles become your struggle as well. Because once you know, you can't just turn your back on things. And so um, I will leave it there for, for right now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll be around if, if there's any questions or anything. I know that was a very short history lesson, but I will leave it for there. Thank you so much, Ms. Bernadette, for that. Or, sorry, I'm so hungry right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. As you may be aware, the proceeds uh, from tonight's dinner will be going towards the Coalition for Families of Missing and Murdered Women of Manitoba. Um, and therefore, I would like to call upon Ms. Bernadette Smith to speak to us about this organization and the work that they do. So I'm just going to talk a little bit how the coalition began. So in 2008, um, my sister went missing. So when my sister went missing, there wasn't a lot of um, support in the community. Like there weren't people coming to us and saying, how can we help you? You know, we'd like to help your family. So in, my sister went missing July 24th of 2008. And in November, we had a community search, so we put up posters, we asked the media to, to let the community know that we were going to search. And we actually had a, a farmer donate his, his uh, house as a command post, and you know, we, we had all this equipment, and you know, we were ready for tons of people to come out. We get to the farmhouse the day of, um, it was starting to get cold. And at this point, the police were telling us we can't, we, we won't search unless we have evidence to search. So we were like, okay, well, we need to do this 
on our own. So the day comes and we're at this farmhouse, which was on Mollard and Pipeline, and three women had been found murdered there, and none of their cases were solved, so we thought, well, and that was kind of the fastest route out from the last place my sister was seen. So there we were the day of, and we thought tons of people would come out, we thought our community would come out. There we were, and it was just our family. So we're going, where, where is everybody? Why doesn't our community care about our people? Like, this is, my sister lives in Winnipeg. Where is our Winnipegers? So my sister comes from a community in Orejos, and um, they ended up sending, and it's about 900 kilometers away from Winnipeg, it's a First Nation, a Cree First Nation. The, they ended up sending out 40 volunteers, 40 of their community members that lived 900 kilometers away. My sister lived there at some point in her life, but she lived mostly in Winnipeg. So they had to send people from another community to come and help search for my sister. So that was a real eye-opener for us. Um, so we thought we need to do some work with community to try, you know, get community involved, get connected to this issue, and, and for them to realize that it's just not, it's not just Indigenous women that are, are affected. That in fact, if you live in this community, just because you're not directly affected, you're affected because, you know, this could happen to anyone. So fast forward to my sister had been missing six months now. We had a vigil, it was January, it was minus 42, it was freezing. And again, we had, you know, gone out to the community, we put up posters, sent media releases, the media were, um, it was on TV for a couple of days. The vigil comes and it's just our family again. And I remember thinking, what's going on? Like again, you know, we had been out in the community talking to people, you know, talking about this issue, trying to get more people involved, and still, there was no community coming. Um, so that summer, what we did was we brought together some people, so some people from the University of Winnipeg, Women and Gender Studies came. There was a lawyer that was studying to be a lawyer, Tanya Capel, she now lives in Edmonton, but she does a lot of work around missing and murder. She came aboard, um, there was various people from the community at grassroots level as well, like came aboard and said, we, we're going to work together for providing some support for families. So that's how our coalition came to be. And it was just in, you know, my house. We would kind of host it at different people's houses. And we would just talk about this whole notion of bringing community together and, and supporting people. Not just Indigenous, you know, people, but all people. You know, if someone goes missing, what can we do to help? And um, so that, that summer we, we did some fundraising, we brought families together, we hosted a, a weekend retreat out at St. Benedict's, and we brought people in to talk about self-care, because our families don't do a lot of self-care. They're sitting by the phone waiting for a phone call, or they're excessively out searching. Some of our families, you know, um, turn to addictions to, to deal with it, so there was various things going on, and we just, we brought families together, and. It was just a beautiful weekend. Um, we had some of our ministers come out too as well to just sit outside our circle and listen to some of the, the barriers that we were facing as families in terms of you know getting a, a police response. In my sister's case, it was 10 days. You know, my sister was 21 and we kept hearing, well, she's an adult, you know, but it was out of character for her. And she never went to day without calling someone. So we didn't feel that response was um, accurate, you know, we thought they should have went out, and, and the other thing was my sister had made a call that was saying that she was somewhere, she was unsafe, and she wanted to be picked up, and that wasn't enough for them to go out. So we worked really hard around changing policy. At the time, you had to be missing for 48 hours, so we worked really hard to change that to, have, you know, it's out of character automatically. That's why you see a lot of pictures being released right away. Um, the other thing we worked towards was uh, my sister had a calling card and they couldn't access those, um, those numbers for two years. So by the time they accessed those records, those records had been, you know, those phones had been disconnected. Some of them were paid to go phones, so there weren't even people attached to them. So when we got a special advisor to women's issues, we were like, you know, a lot of the work we had been doing, our special advisor took over. Our government's now started to um, support our families, which was great. We were super happy, and you 
you know, we got on board in, in working together collaboratively. Um, but now we have a change of government, so here we are kind of back where we started from. You know, there's been a lot of work done, but now we're looking at how do we continue to support those families without that position and without that person being able to do that work. So the funds that are, are, that are uh, brought together from tonight's evening, that money will go towards supporting those families. So every year we've always brought families together around Christmas time. That's a super hard time for families. You know, you bring family together and you have a placement there for your family member and they're not there. We also, um, it creates a support network for families. So families can call another family when they're feeling, you know, that they just, they need someone to talk to. So. I just want to say thank you to the Islamic Association for inviting us and for reaching out to us. And I was sharing with um, our brother here when we, we did an interview together that, you know, we're all connected. We're all interconnected, you know. There may be seven degrees of separation, but somewhere we're all connected. Like I see faces here, people that I've seen in the community at various points. You know, I work in education, I work with a lot of our children, and we're working towards creating, you know, not the otherness, but the oneness. How do we look at their commonalities rather than their differences? So this is bridge building at, you know, at its finest. So I want to say thank you, Miigwech, and, you know, super proud to be here and a part of this. Thank you. So we will be breaking our fast very soon, actually, in two minutes. Um, so as soon as, uh, we will be breaking our fast as soon as the prayer is initiated, about three minutes, okay. Um, after the call to prayer, we, uh, sorry, after we break our fast, then we will be praying the mother of prayer. So on my, on that side is the men's side and that side is the women's side. So you can feel free if you choose to go and see uh, the prayer. Um, uh, I believe they might open these areas I've been told so you can see it from here as well so you don't have to go to the side and see um, and once the prayer is complete then we will have dinner thank you so much Thank you.